my future mathematicians. This is Miss Hearn. Let's get started. This is part two of our discussion of how to prove the limit of a rational function using a delta epsilon argument. In the first part, we learned that we can use a certain technique under certain circumstances to find our delta, which is the key to a delta epsilon proof. So what we're gonna look at now is a specific example of how to use that technique. We're going to prove that the limit as x approaches two of four x plus one over x plus one squared is equal to one. In order to apply the technique that um, I'm about to use, you need to observe that this particular limit could be um, calculated by plugging two into the function f of x. So um, in this case, notice if f of x is equal to four x plus one over x plus one squared, then uh, we're taking the limit as x approaches two, um, f of two would be four times two plus one over two plus one squared, which is gonna be nine over nine or one. So in that situation, one thing that you can do is to find a number c that bounds the difference quotient or actually the absolute value of the difference quotient. Once we've recognized that this is a situation where plugging in a gives us the limit, we can now move on to trying to find this number c. After we find c, we're going to let delta equal epsilon over c and then write out our proof. So here we go. Let's work on step one, finding c. We are interested in bounding f of x minus f of two in this case, a is two, over x minus two. I'm going to replace each of these with what they're equal to. So f of x is four x plus one over x plus one squared. f of two, we just plugged in and we found that's equal to one. And we have this over x minus two. Let's simplify a little bit. So I am going to multiply the top and the bottom of this guy by um, the denominator x plus one squared. Okay, distributing, um, it's okay to bring this inside the absolute value. It's a positive anyway. So we're going to get, um, uh, it's gonna cancel out the x plus one squared in the first term. So we're gonna just get four x plus one minus x plus one squared. And then in the denominator, we have x minus two times x plus one squared. x plus one squared is gonna be x squared plus two x plus one, but we're subtracting. So we're gonna have a negative x squared, and we're gonna have four x minus two x is a positive two x, and then we have a positive one minus one cancels. I'm gonna leave the denominator in factored form, which is preferable anyway. And then notice that that numerator factors and so we have negative x times x minus two over x minus two times x plus one squared. We can reduce a bit there. The absolute value of negative x over x plus one squared, although we're taking an absolute value, so we don't really need that negative there. We could just say x. Now, at this point, be careful. Remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out a constant value that this is less than. And when you first look at this, it might be tempting to say, oh, well, that's got to be less than one because the denominator is bigger, right? But not always. So um, one thing that I like to do is to graph the function that I'm analyzing here real quick. I like to pop it into desmos.com or my graphing calculator. If you graph the absolute value of x over x plus one squared, notice that's not always less than one because um, for values right around negative one there, you're gonna get a tiny little fraction in the denominator, and then the division is going to cause this uh, value to explode. So definitely we, we can't bound that for every x. But luckily, we're talking about a limit, and so we're not actually concerned about every x. Let's go back and recall what limit we're trying to work out. We're trying to prove this limit. Limits are all about what's happening near that particular x value. So we're concerned about what's happening when x is very close to two. Close to two, we don't have a problem, right? So what we can do in our delta epsilon proofs is we can make an assumption 
that we're only working with x values very close to a, or in this case, 2. So we are going to assume that our uh, delta keeps us close enough to 2 that we don't have a problem with the uh, bounding of that expression. In other words, remember that in the beginning of the delta epsilon definition of the limit, we assume that um, uh, if absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, that all of the nice stuff happens, right? Well, in this case, we're talking about the absolute value of x minus 2 being less than a particular value. Well, if I let delta equal 1, so I'm only one unit away on either side from 2, then that guarantees that my x values are between 1 and 3, and I won't have the problem of having an unbounded expression. I can say that this absolute value of x over x plus 1 squared has a larger denominator than it does numerator, is less than or equal to 1 for all x in the interval from 1 to 3. Now what does that do for our proof? Well, step two in the technique that we're using is to define delta to be equal to epsilon over c. Okay, so we found c. This is the c, the one. So that would mean that we should let delta equal epsilon over one, or epsilon in this case. But here's the problem. Epsilon can be any number greater than zero. And remember, we're assuming that delta is less than or equal to 1. But that's actually not a big problem, because what you can do is you can just define delta to be the minimum of either 1 or epsilon. Whichever is smaller, that's the one that we're going to use. So we have found our delta, and now we're going to use that to write out our proof. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to watch part three where we actually write out the delta epsilon proof for the limit. The link to part three is on the screen or you can find it in the comments section below.